I never ever exceed that. Once I hit 175, something's wrong. And nothing is happening that should happen, you back up. Back up and rethink. On, on our 12 or our 134 A system. On AC or just refrigeration? Refrigeration, AC, anyone, but you won't see our uh, 12, I mean, 134 system, AC, no, except in the that. car. Yeah. <clears throat> That's not to say somebody wouldn't use it. We can use it. You know, once you, um, once you adjust the temperature range, you can use it. But <clears throat> 134 in a refrigeration system, and you're looking at this kind of pressure, like I said, back up. You have a torque <laughs> condenser, or you're overcharged. <laughs> Right. So for R12 to 20 PSIG, 145 degrees. I thought they were always looking for 10 degrees with the uh, well, right? <coughs> water out. That's what my pressure, my regulator is set at, right? Uh-huh. And it's going to try to maintain the 10 degrees. It's going to maintain that 10 degrees there. It's going to try. Okay. But we'll here's try. the thing. I do not have the flow rate. Okay? Mm -hmm. I do not have the flow rate because this is fouled up. Right. See? I'm going to have high temperature. I'm going to have a low split. <laughs> Temperatures here that will well with the range, but flow rate. That's why we take the bucket and measure how much water we have coming out. Because if you know the tonnage of the system, you're supposed to know how much water will be coming out of there. And you know, every if you notice, every truck has a bucket. It's not for that purpose, but we do have a bucket in the truck in case something spills somewhere. Yeah. You know, we always have something. Like that, some kind of contain in the truck. Yeah. Now, recirculating water system, like I said, these are water towers, or it could be, um, in the case of geothermals, it could be a well. Right? Water comes in. This example, guide you, is for a cooling tower system, right? And recirculating means us that. We take the water from point A, take it to point B, let it do something, and bring it back to point A, and continue that. It's more, it's more or less um, like a closed loop system, except that there is a, it's a misnomer, but one, one part of it is open anyhow. But it's still like, it is a closed loop. It goes from point A to B, and back to point A, and then to point B again. It's all the same water. Yes, the same water all the time we, we circulate it. That's why we need um, a higher flow rate because the temperatures are pretty much closer together and it's higher than normal than you know than you will get out of a well or something. Right. The water is constantly colder. All right? Probably about six or five degrees. Um, <clears throat> so water enters and leave at 95 in a water cool system, guys. Condenser saturation is always 10 degrees higher than the leave in water temperature. So we have that 10 degree split, split right, right throughout in the water circuit as well as the refrigerant circuit. Now, I don't know if you ever heard this. But on a very, very humid day, most of those large air conditioned systemic cooling towers does not perform efficiently. As the humidity rises, efficiency drops. Okay, and that's, oh, that's because a cooling tower can only cool that water to within seven degrees of the wet bulb temperature. So, no, wet bulb. So if my wet bulb temperature is 80 degrees, 
it cannot cool it below 8 to 7 degrees. 73. All right, no. My wet bulb is 80 degrees. All right? Ah, uh, 73, right? 73. Yeah. All right, but it... And it can never go over. It, it, it's not going to go below, mm -hmm. below that. All right? So, um, no, it says within 70 degrees. So this is going to, if it's 80 degrees, it's going to go up. It can pull it down to 85. It can pull it down to 87. Okay. All right? This water enters, right? And it's supposed to <coughs> heat up there. So it enters this, it enters the um, condenser at 85. Oh. Heats up at 95 and it has to cool from 95 down to that. So seven from 95 is 88 actually. Yeah. Yeah. All right? So it can only cool this up to 88 degrees if it's at 88. Present a um, wet bulb. 80 degrees wet bulb. So as humidity goes up, efficiency decreases because this you're not going to get effective cooling that you need. Right. So what do they do to compensate for that? Or there's nothing, nothing they can do? <clears throat> just run with a little it less. Just runs. It's like um, it's like an air cool system on a very hot day. You have to live with it. Okay. And this is where sometimes um, you actually see steam coming off of some of those cooling towers. Because it's so hot, the water is coming back so hot, hotter than uh, 95. So everything all around will be hot. This is where your system is working full speed. And more, it's more or less just trying to maintain whatever the temperature is within the structure. It's gonna have a hard time trying to pull it up. But it will do it eventually, give me enough run time. Right. But it's it's going to struggle to maintain before it can pull it up. Type in? No. Good eyes, the right hand. Oh, by the way, you see what this is? You don't need to. You don't need to do that because the, the water temperature is always within this range. With the um, the reason why we use water regulating valve with the with the wastewater system is that the water comes on into the system at around 65 or somewhere there is above. So you have to restrict that water flow until the temperature builds up before you allow it to go out. Okay. It's like it behaves like a fan cycle control. When we need cooling, the water is allowed to flow through. We don't need cooling. You when you don't need cooling it begins to travel down and shut down the valve. It increases the temperature of it? Yes, it increases. It, it tends to want to maintain the temperature of the condenser at a constant 105 um, degrees here. So it, the water should be coming out at 95. So it's going to. Yeah, and what this, the valve, water line goes to it, water line comes out to go to the condenser, but the tube in that senses that tells the spark whether to open or close is actually connected to the discharge Water. or high side of the refrigerant. It senses refrigerant pressure. So it's connected somewhere in that high pressure line. And as temperature goes up, you know pressure will go up. Yeah. And as pressure go, goes up, it opens a diaphragm to allow water to flow through. Okay, and as pressure drops, the diaphragm slowly goes. The diaphragm actually operates like this, straighten and course. We're going in 
to this again. You're not going to see your feet and your head up like this. Typical problems, you know, this is troubleshooting, right? <coughs> Low refrigerant charge, you need to know. Um, it's amazing what superheat and subcooling right here will tell you about whether I have a low refrigerant charge or excess refrigerant charge. I mean, your gauges will show you, but um, you need to know the concept of how to calculate this superheat subcooling. I know yesterday we talked about restriction and inefficient compressor, inefficient evaporator, inefficient condenser. You know, if we load refrigerant charge, both of these will be inefficient. If we have excessive refrigerant charge, both of these will be inefficient. So, two problems, they mimic each, they other. Mimic each other, right? But the gauges, in this case, your gauges will, um, will tell you yeah. An inefficient compressor, but like, what does it just just become worn over? I mean, because it's going to be sized for the system, right? So it just becomes worn because of other things that are going wrong in the system, right? Yes. Um, because the compressor just, I mean, it's, it's going to be sized for that, so it should. Yeah, be. inefficient compressor. Really, what it means is that the compressor has worn out to such a point where it's not pumping the amount of refrigerant I need. So it's not keeping up the, what we call the mass flow rate. Just wear and tear, right? So, yeah, so, you know. it's just normal wear and tear, and most of the time, it's the valves. You know, these are real valves. In those compressors, they're thin, like this sheet of paper. So one side is bolted down, and the other side move up and down as the piston move up and down. So over a period of time, it loses that spring action, gotcha. and it get worn out because it's slamming onto a C2. So there will be refrigerant leaking back. And right back. They, you'll find eventually, you know, the pressures will begin. You'll see head pressure begin to go down, suction pressure begin to go up, and there comes a point sometime when the compressor is running, but the two pressures are like this. Saying, it's uh -huh. not doing anything. That means it's, it's not doing recycling anything. Recycling. No. Yes, it's just, recycling. just running there in spaces like you're running. Yeah. Like those people who go to the gym and stand up on a machine and run, mm -hmm. you know. They don't yeah. go anywhere, but they, they really Yes, they don't go anywhere and they get in there pretty fast. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Now, restriction in the refrigerant circuit. This, at one, it shows up as two things. On this side, it shows up as an overcharge, and on this side, it shows up as an undercharge. Given that the restriction is somewhere in between the evaporator and the metering device. Very rare you will find a restriction in the suction line coming off of the evaporator cord. Other than if somebody goes and deliberately put a sledgehammer to that and squish it the right down, flatten it. Yeah, so there is a um, restriction would, on this side, it will tell you that, hey, I'm overcharged. But on this side, it's going to tell you, hey, I'm undercharged. Now you've got to make up your mind which one you want to go by. Uh, typically, it depends on your, um, depending on your metering device. and. They say with the TXB to just charge on the high side. I mean, charge going by your high side and leave it, leave the low side alone. Don't pay attention to it. Yep. But um, let's say we have a capillary tube in here, and you will see this. If you guys ever happen to go work for Sears or PC Richards, or um, what is the other company that does these lift, these? G. GE, and these guys who does residential refrigerators, those who make that thing and match a chef. Oh, yeah. Now, the metering device on those fridges you have at home, they're capillary tube. Critically charged. And they're critical charge system. But they use 1 to 4A. 
134A <coughs> has a tendency to, remember I mentioned earlier that these blends of refrigerant are about some of the best detergent mankind ever made. It washes all the crap that was in those lines and it takes it straight to the capillary tube. First it's gonna go through the filter. So if enough small particles pass the filter, it's gonna go to the cap tube. In some cases, the filter will block up before the cap tube does. And you know, the filter takes everything out. Fine, you will have a blockage there or you can have it in the capillary tube. But that's a one place. With all these domestic refrigerators, when you have that problem with restriction, that's it. That's where you block. And religiously, with almost every 134 a system with cap tube uh, metering device, that happens. I don't know, I've changed so many of them. You know, I had to repair so many because of black page. Not, the, the compressors are strong. They work, they're like work horses, you know? Mm -hmm. But just the blockage you have to take care of. And you go in there, cut out the filter dryer, back pressure the system, make sure the capillary tube is blowing out something, put in a new filter dryer. Well, of course, if the capillary tube is not blowing out anything, that's blocked too. And you need to change the whole cap tube. And if you do not have the right one, they do have like, one, two, three, four, five different sizes out on the market where you can replace those. All you need to do, do is the, the mat, the, the five, one mm -hmm. length you need the new size thing. Um, the length and all yeah. And maybe one these days I'll show you. What day? We got two days left. I'm free Wednesday. I'm free Wednesday. How much you want to take me and show me something? Come here. How are you service calling? I don't do much service calls. Well, whenever. Same difference. Are you sure? Thursday. Fine, Thursday, too. Uh, I'll take that under, under consideration. Yeah. Thank you. So inefficient compressor, if it's the valves, you definitely will know at some point when the pressures equalize. Uh, one of the things you can do is shut down, shut, uh, shut off the systems, turn off the switch, and look at the gauges. And if, if the gauges begin to equalize like that, you know, you, you know that you have a problem with that compressor. It's not supposed to jump and equalize. It's supposed to take roughly two minutes for those pressures to equalize. But if it does it in under, um, if it does a use in bolt thing, it change the compressor. You don't even think about it. Of course, you have to recover. Remember that. Always recover your refrigerant, guys. All right? Because. When I'm talking up here, it's with the assumption that you know how to recover, that you, you will follow the rules and regulations. It's your, you know, it's your livelihood on the line, so be careful. There are people out there who uh, have... Troubleshoot the compressor or not. Huh? So your pressures aren't right and you shut it off. Yeah, if those so pressures if jump right up and equalize. Right, if the pressures equalize right away, you have a compressor problem. You have a, yeah, that's definitely a bad compressor. Well, because Metering device, even, even, there are some, earlier we talked about this, I think the first chapter, when I told you guys about these drinks cases they have in these deli, you know the one with the glass sliding door. What they have, the 99% of the cases, they use a pressure switch to control the temperature in that right. case. Mm -hmm. And, and when the um, system cycles off, the TXV holds whatever pressure differential was there, the TXV holds it. It does not allow refrigerant to go through. Once the compressor shuts off, TXV shuts down. 
So whatever is on the low side is there, whatever is on the high side is there. All right? It won't equalize. No, the pressures don't equalize through the TXP. That's, that's what allows it to work with the pressure sphere. All right? And if the pressures equalize at that point, it's, it has to be the compressor. It's not going to be the TX3. If you suspect it's, it is the TX3, then you need to put um, some kind of valve in the line. You have to take that out. But I'll tell you how you can tell it's not the TXV. All right? Guess what? TXV is designed to do what? Keep the superheat. Keep, keep the superheat. So regardless of my charge, regardless of the system behave, if my TXV is holding 10 degrees superheat it was designed to hold, it means it's working, right? Yeah. So the, then the problem is down below. If you have a problem with the pressures and the thing and the TXV superheat is out of range, it is the TXV. So once the TXV is maintaining superheat, that's good. If it's not maintaining superheat, then that's the culprit. Very rare. No, but can't you make an adjustment on the, on the TXV at all? Can you adjust that meter in the device? You can adjust it. We do not. Add, we do not advise that. We don't even teach you to touch it. No, because you said it's most likely it's set the way it's once, You see, it's factory set, right? And once you change that set in, you have to wait like 15, 20 minutes for every quarter turn. You have to wait 15, 20 minutes. Doesn't mean the manufacturer didn't make a mistake on the customer. Well, if they do make a mistake, no matter what you set it to, once it's messed up, it's messed up. Yeah. All right. What I'm going to tell you is this: if your TXV is not maintaining the superheat, you can need to decrease the superheat. Open the valve, wind the stem up, open the valve, check it. You know, this is with the assumption that your customer has food in that fridge. And you need to hold a certain temperature until you go out and get a TX3 and come and replace it. Do that. That's the only time you should touch it. Right. The moment you touch it, you throw everything out of out of balance. You know, the only time you should adjust it is to hold over until you get a new one to replace it. And typically do not allow kind of four hours. Because once it's bad, like I said, it is bad and it's gonna go crazy bad. Okay. As you, um, <laughs> okay, so nobody, even the manufacturers of the TXV, Danfoss, uh, Sporland, mm -hmm. Parker, Emerson, they're always advised. Never, never try to adjust it in the field. You just, yeah. you just fixing a symptom of the problem. Yeah, in a case like that, not, yes. You know, you're not taking care of what causes it. I mean. Problem. I'm not saying there's not going to be a factory defect, but if there is a factory defect, so no matter how you adjust it, you can't get so overcome that defect. What you one. could do is That's scale it out. That's the only time to adjust this way. You can run out and get another one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Just so your customer feel, you know, your trip. The whole idea is try to keep your customer's food, you know, to a point where you want to spoil. And you have a customer for life to do something like that. You may take a little loss in it because you have to drop something to go out and pick up this and do that as an emergency. But like I said, you have a customer for that. That's how I got all my customers word of mouth. Never, I never had sent out a fly, I never sent out a, I don't even have a card in this guy. People dress up on a card and say, hey, you know, I, I got your number from so and so and you say you do so and so and can you come and check me? Yeah. And one of the things when my customers refer, refer me, they always tell the customer who they're referring to, you know, it's a little bit expensive, but... But they don't argue with you about the price, they don't say, yeah. you guess, your, your work, they just say, okay, because they were, you know, much easier to sell. Yeah. Well, no refrigerant charge, 
Of course, we will have reduced system capacity. We will have low pressures all around. High side, low side will be low. And see, this is a whole beast all by itself, automatic expansion valve. I'm thinking um, But you can actually, you can charge that to by superheat, can't you? What, the PXV? Yeah, uh, PXV. Just trying to charge the TXV by superheat is like, it's kind of... You never, you never charge a TXV system by superheat. You do it with subcooling, right? You do it with subcooling? No, because it always going to try and keep that tannage. Well, if you try to charge this and it's a hot pull down, it's going to be hunting right up. Okay. And, uh, the, the best time to measure this superheat is like when you're within about two degrees of set point temperature. At that point, the, the operation should be stable enough. Um, now, remember I told you this work kind of like a dumb file. It does things backward. Yeah, when you need Just when you need it most, it's not there for you. Yeah. It's a kind of weird love story, you know. As the system load increases, pressure will go up in your evaporator, right? That's when this will shut down. When this will shut down, it will, show, it will pull down into a lower temperature, then it's going to do the same thing again. Because what it's going to do when it pressure gets low, it's going to go open fully and shoot a ton of the refrigerant. So it is going to be erratic. So you, you will not see too, so much of a low suction pressure on this. But overall, your pressures will be low. Your net pressure will definitely, definitely be out of range. This one here, compressor will often run hot. <clears throat> I did two exact the Atlantic systems, two of them side by side yesterday. Mm -hmm. Same exact thing. One had low pressures. And the compressor on it, I mean, you could boil an egg on, on that compressor. The other one was hot, but it wasn't that nearly as hot. Like, really, really, well, really hot, that compressor was really Well, it's, uh, both had the same problem, low, low, low gas? The other one, the other one, if it was low on gas, it wasn't shown. No, it wasn't low on gas. No, th but that run hot because it was compensating for the other one. It was loaded, fully loaded, probably overloaded. Well, they're separate. They're separate. Yeah, but it's stage one, stage two. Yeah. So, bottom line is, when stage, when both stages are running, and one takes out, the other one automatically, not that it does take the load, but it is exposed to the complete. Yeah that load. So it is going to work hard because it's seeing higher head, higher suction pressures and it's going to see higher um, head pressure. High suction pressure, the temperature in the refrigerant that's supposed to cool that thing would be up in the higher well, range too. The, the head pressure was uh, 75 PSI G on R12 system. That 75 was the or 20 oh, 22. 75 is pretty low. It's for head, for head pressure, it was the head pressure, and the suction pressure was in the low, low like. Yeah, that's the one that had no no refrigerant in it, right? Yeah, barely any refrigerant. Yeah. and, and no. the compressor was like you couldn't hold your hands on it. It was so hot. Here's the thing that some people just can't grasp. When the system is low pressure. Um, low on charge, the pressures are going to be low. Low suction pressure, if you check your PT chart, it's going to show you a very low temperature. Very, so very we can low show low. you in, into the negative freezing zone. Mm -hmm. so that in no way point. means that the temperature of that refrigerant gas coming back to your compressor is negative 10. I knew it was nice. Right, here's the deal. If, if I'm at negative 10, that corresponds to SST, right? Yeah. It does not take into consideration that that gas boiled off within the forest pass 
of your evaporator coil. And what you're reading is actually the point at which the gas boils off completely, which is negative 10. But the rest, 90% of the evaporator is absorbing heat. The refrigerant is absorbing that superheat now. Super and the superheat is sky high. Sky high. Yeah. Now, typically, maximum super allowing superheat going back to a compressor 20 degrees. 20 degrees. So Anything about that is going to overheat your compressor. Add the compressor. Yes. Yeah, this was double that. So that's why, the why your compressor is going to overheat. So he, he's low on refrigerant then, right? Yeah, if, if all around your pressures are low, you're low on refrigerant. Yeah. So, And of course you will have high superheat. When you get low charge, high superheat. Just remember that. that I, actually, I just mentioned it here, right? With the negative 10, you get excessively high superheat. Subcooling is non-existent. He's telling me, it's, it's telling me the coil is at negative 20, but it's not frozen, I saw it. Right, so that means you're low on gas. Yeah, he's low on gas. That's what right. I told him. But you will, for it to be there, you have to, um, you have to have a decent leak. Now, is it a leak or just because it's... No, it is a leak. If it's I mean, if a system was running and then all of a sudden it's low on gas, yeah. either somebody pulled that gas out or there's a leak. Eight years. Eight years. Eight years running? Yeah. Years. So you think to recover it all, no. leak test it, or just put the gas in it? Just... Um, shut down the system the if you have some nitrogen pressure with nitrogen and look for a liquid soap liquid. Mm. But I would advise you definitely if it, that's if your leak is to that point, you need to evacuate it anyway. Evacuate it, then yes. then leak test. Yes. Guess here's what happens when the compressor begins to overheat, it breaks down. Yeah. And it form it forms sludge in that oil, sludge and, and um. Acid. Yeah, acid when the and that acid will be there and create um, sulfur and all that from yeah. stuff. Yeah. So you, if you evacuate, you're not getting rid of everything, but you're getting rid of at least some something there that will contribute to the compressor going totally bad. Yeah. So at least you're trying to prolong the life of the system then. But just let the customer know that, hey, you can't guarantee anything that... So just putting gas in, then I shouldn't do... I should, I should pull leak everything check. out? Oh, you leak check, check first. Yeah. Leak, test it and, yes. leak test it and do everything you have to, right? right? Well, that, that's better for me. So. And you see, that way to say is compressor will often run hot when, you, when you're low on gas. Yeah, this thing... It do. also does it um, sometimes if you really, really overfill the system. It does it too. It's gonna run hot because they, you just have in circulation <laughs> without any refrigeration, so it's not gonna cool down. When you say wait for the pressure to balance out, but you know you want to check the compressor. The system's got to be running in order for it to balance out, right? No. no. Have it off. Well, you can't have a high side and a low side if it's, if it's off. If the system is running, I'm going to have a low side pressure and a high side pressure. It's going to be like this, right? Right. If I want to balance it, I have to shut down the system shut down. and okay. see if it's going to... Uh, they balanced that when I shut it down. Yeah, but no, chances are in this case, it's, it's uh, once you have overall low pressures, yeah. low head pressure, low suction pressure, you're looking at, you're looking at the undercharge system. And chances are you'd lose the gas either to a leak or somebody may accidentally did something and um, play with a straight of a pin or something, you know, or the straight of a pin probably develop a leak, which they always do at times. Is there caps on there, on the valves? Or There's caps, there are caps sure, on I was going to say, make sure they're tight and stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm going to just no, go to the same. He's a very nice guy. The packing know. nuts will leak no, sometimes. No, he's the Honeywell rep on Long Island. He's a very nice guy. Refrigerant overcharge, except for AX3. You notice the AX3 mm -hmm. is a B style and it's known again, all right? But you will have a... Uh, High head pressure, high suction pressure. And 
depends on, on the severity of the overcharge, I've seen those pressures equalize. While the compressor's running, <coughs> both needles are looking like this and looking at me, and they ain't moving left, right, this way on the center line. Yeah. In a case like that, guys, you have no alternative but to recover on our refrigerant and start from scratch. But I can't, I can't see how you will go to a system to answer service call and find out that it's overcharged. If it's been there and been running yeah. for a couple of years. Mostly on the so show. Not unless they tell you, oh, there was a guy here yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, it's pretty easy. You remember I was telling you guys that we only charge relative to the high side um, yeah. pressure and or condenser saturation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a reason. And there's a reason why you need to learn to use your gauges. One guy was working with a company called MCOR. I'm sure you've seen that van around. Right. He considered himself the top technician in a field where the top technician hardly knew how to wipe his ass. Mm -hmm. <coughs> they sent him to do summarization in April, May month. He put his gauges, his low side gauge on, right? Now, what? April and May, it's cool. It's still cool outside. He did not put his high side gauge on, he put his low side gauge on. Turn on the system. Now he's reading temperature inside the building, right? Yeah. And he's reading the temperature coil temperature of about um, 25 degrees or so, okay? So here's the thing, or even 30 degrees. So my um, suction saturation temperature is 30, I mean pressure is 30 PSI. And on a normal day, Suction, saturation, pressure on an R22 system, 40 degree coil is 68.5, right? You know what this idiot did? He subtract this from this, which left me with 38.5, right? He took a whole can of refrigerant in, into each unit he went to. He went, he's, during that period, he was working alone and he serviced 60 of these units. <laughs> yeah. He came back, the company bought 60 cans of R22 just for him. Wow. When the people actually turn on the unit the first decent warm day, they can't get cooling. So the company now sent a young lady named Don Marie to check this system. Very good. She's very good at this. She's, she wraps some guys around her little finger with her knowledge. She's at my level, I tell you that. And then she's looking at this. Oh, no, okay. she give me a call, right? Say, hey, how, tell me if I'm right. But this freaking thing is overcharged. So, you know, we go through the pressure, the, you know, check the superheat, check everything she went through, and check everything she said, you know. This thing definitely is overcharged. So, hey, you know what? Do you suspect that and everything is pointing to that? Let's grab an empty recovery tank and recover some of the gas. All right? Let's see how it runs. And she's there and think the recovery machine is running and running like the energizer bunny to pull out the, this gas. So eventually when she got it, everything out, the recovery tank was showing full on the scale. Yes, sir. And it was a 50 pounder recovery. Oh, wow. How many tanks did she need? Wow. She needed one for the system. These are residential. So, she, she, no, but here's the thing. Now, what, what she did, she re used the same gas and star charge the system from scratch. 
and put in the required amount of the gas as for the being paid, right? Then she weighed the gas that was remaining, it ended up being the same amount you would get out of a full can. So she went back to the office or she got it out and said, hey, you know, this is what, this is the freaking amount of gas I put out in the system. So they went back and they checked their files and they finally bought this, this was one of this guy's service called to start off a salon. And he went to 60 and they actually bought 60 cans, right? which is a whole pallet by the way. So, you know, before things went really bad because it overcharged, you can really screw your compressor. They decided they're going to call these people and send a technician there and recover the yeah. future. Well, wouldn't the wouldn't red flag go up when a guy wants 60 cans and he's doing 60 services? You see, I don't know if the red flag didn't go up. You know, yeah, because every, everything bone dry whatever happened to the service system. manager? Right, yeah. yeah. You know, that's, that's the guy. Do you need 60 gas? Give me a five. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Give me a five. So, I'll send somebody empty on a week. So, so overcharge, go. guys. One thing you must remember with an overcharge. When you check some cooling, it's very high. Okay? But it's overcharged. But it's overcharged. I'm sure and when we positive. come back from the break, I'm going to explain that because that's something a lot of people don't grasp that concept. Well, it's overcharged, you have a high shock.